Good morning. It's good to see you. Good to have you all here this morning. As the, the song that kind of started our whole uh, worship service this morning reminded us, it is joy unspeakable and full of glory. I have found his grace is all complete. I have found the pleasure I once craved. I found the hope so bright and close. I have found the joy no tongue can tell. All of this and so much more is available in Christ. As we are hearing, as we are responding, as we are following, as, uh, as God leads us, what a fabulous thing this morning as uh, we recognize that God has called us and we have responded this morning to his call by being here. I'm glad that, that you did hear. I'm glad that you are responding. I'm glad that you are here today for I am excited to hear and to see what it is that God has in store for us today. We turn our attention first to the announcements, the opportunities that we have over the next uh, week or so to, uh, uh, to be involved in the activities around our church, to be involved in the things going on in our community. And the first one, of course, is this, and I've heard several people say this already, but Happy Father's Day. Uh, happy Father's Day to all of our dads, all of our grandpas, all of the folks who are here today. Uh, thank you so much, especially, especially you Christian men who are involved and active in the lives of your family. Thank you for the witness that you are. Uh, just as we are grateful for our, our Christian ladies and for, and for the moms on Mother's Day, we are grateful also for the impact and the influence of our Christian dads. Thank you so much. Happy, happy Father's Day today. Uh, we do have discipleship study coming up this week, Wednesday night, 7 p.m., right over in the Fellowship Hall area. Uh, please come for that. That is a, a fabulous time of, of getting involved, of, of re, kind of uh, uh, reapplying, I guess you could say, uh, what we've talked about on Sunday morning, going over the scriptures again and seeing how the idea of what we talked about on Sunday morning actually fits into the scope and the realm of discipleship. So that's Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, right over here. Vacation Bible School, right around the corner. This Saturday, we are six days away. Is that right? Six days away. You can tell by the look of, of horror and fear and hopefulness and fear on Pam's face over here. So there you go. Six days away. Now, once again this year, as we've done the last couple of years, it's going to be down at the Robinson Primary Building. We are joining up with uh, joining forces with the Cornerstone Church from down Highway 77. And uh, so we're looking forward to having just a, an excellent time, a wonderful time of getting together there. Uh, set up probably starts sometime around 7.30 Saturday morning. So if you're involved in that sometime between 7.30 or 8, that you can be there to start helping get things set up. And then the kids start showing up between 8 and 9. And uh, we go until we can't go anymore. And then we go home and take a nap and take a shower and come back up for Saturday night where we're having our, uh, our family movie night, Saturday night, right up here again in the Fellowship Hall area. Uh, we are showing Esther uh, this coming Saturday evening, June 24th at 6 p.m., uh, We've done this before. This is not our first time, so uh, you guys, you guys kind of figured out before what to do. Um, snacks, sandwiches, whatever it is, however it is that you want to do that, uh, make sure that uh, that you do that. And somebody, if you see, if you see Bill this next week, which Bill? Well, that's a good question. If you see Bill White this next week, uh, make sure that you let him know that hey, you don't have to bring popcorn for everybody this time, Bill. We got it. We. A couple more of us can bring it as well. But Bill did a fabulous job last time in making popcorn for everybody. What, what a great, great servant's heart that he demonstrated by doing that. So we do have that coming up on Saturday night. Do want to mention, of course, as we usually do, the offering basket is right there at the door as you come into the sanctuary. Uh, thank you so much for your continued support for all of the different ministries, all of the different missions that, that our church is involved in. Uh, whether it's uh, the Lesters who are, I think, no longer in Iraq, on their way to Israel, currently on, uh, on furlough right now in the U.S., whether it's the Persilies in Slovenia, uh, whether it's the food pantry right around the corner from us, no matter what it is, thank you so much for your continued and ongoing support of all of the ministries and missions uh, the, of our local church. Um, yesterday was food pantry day. Do we have any numbers yet, John? No numbers yet. No numbers yet, but uh, I know that yesterday morning at, at men's prayer breakfast we were talking about how already at 
7 o'clock yesterday morning. Folks were lined up all the way from the food pantry all the way up to the, uh, uh, to the, to the administration building, it seemed like. So it was a long line of folks. So what a, what a blessing it is to be able to be a part of, uh, of helping out in the need for that. Trail Life and American Heritage Girls is uh, currently, both those troops are currently on summer break. We did have a planning uh, meeting yesterday with the adults, so we are planning for a humongous and fabulous uh, year that kicks off again at the end of August. So continue to pray for Trail Life and American Heritage Girls and for the ministries that are there. You can always keep in touch with what's going on here, with what's going on with the other Bethel Methodist churches at BethelMethodist.com. We are at BethelMethodist.com. Slash, anybody want to guess? Robinson, there you go. Good job, James. It's like you've been there before. As we go to the scriptures this morning, we are reminded that God continues to call. And that as God continues to call, the proper thing for us to do is to listen and respond. We respond. It's our choice. It's our choice in how we respond to God. Do we respond positively and listen and obey? Do we, do we respond negatively and say no? That's the choice that's before us today. How will we, how will we, how will we respond as God is calling to us? The psalmist writes these words in Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, truly, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O oh Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father, this morning, as we come to this place, we recognize that you have brought us here. We recognize, Lord God, that you are the one at work in us, among us. And so we pray, Father, for your spirit to move among us today. Lord God, this is your place. We are your people. Shape us, mold us, use us. Speak to us, Lord God, through the music that we sing, through the scripture that is read, through the word that is proclaimed. In all that goes on in this place this morning, Father, we ask for you to be at work. Strengthen us, Lord God. Strengthen our minds that we might be able to respond to you properly with understanding, reason, reasonably, rationally. Strengthen our bodies, Lord God, that we might go where you lead us. Strengthen our spirits, Lord God that we might reflect to the world around us all that we know to be true about you. Father, we cannot do this on our own. We recognize that. We confess that we need you every moment, every day. We need your strength. We need your grace. We are dependent upon you, Lord God, to be what you need us to be in this world today. Father, thank you. Thank you for bringing us to this place today. Thank you, Lord God, for the work that you have already done. Thank you, Lord God, for the work that you will do in each of us here today. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing together today, you're invited to stand. It's optional. You don't have to. If you're not able to, just uh, continue to have a seat. But uh, let's, uh, let's sing together. Number 97 in our hymnals, sing praise to God who reigns above. <laughs> Sing praise to God who reigns above, the God of all creation. 
the God of power, the God of love, the God of our salvation. With healing balm, my soul he fills, and every faithless murmur stills to God all praise and glory. The Lord is never far away, but through all grief distressing and ever present help and stay our peace and joy and blessing as with a mother's tender hand he leads his own his chosen band to god all praise and glory thus all my toil some way along I sing aloud his praises that all may hear the grateful song my voice unwearied praises. Be joyful in the Lord my heart, both soul and body. Bear your part to God all praise and glory. That all who name Christ's holy name Give God all praise and glory. Let all his own his power proclaim aloud the wondrous story. Cast every idol from its throne, for Christ is Lord and Christ alone. To God all praise and glory. Continue to stand as we hear from the scriptures in Romans. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's turn in our hymnals to number 344, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there when the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold Threaten the soul with infinite loss Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold Points to the refuge, the mighty cross Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that will pardon and cleanse within Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, 
God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Let's continue to pronounce in our confession of faith the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. As we prepare to pray today, I had a, a phone call before service began this morning from uh, Miss Jerry Kyle, who uh, asked us to be in prayer for her. She said that she has uh, really been sick this week. She said, I've been to the doctor. I've had a whole day's worth of tests run on me. And so some of you know what that's like and how exhausting that alone can be. So we are certainly remembering Miss Jerry this morning as we pray. We have a number of other folks, of course, that we're always... Uh, that are always on our mind, who are always uh, always mindful to, to remember in prayer, and uh, a few of those are with us this morning. So I'm very glad that that Neil is able to make it this morning. Very glad uh, to see you, sir, as you continue to go through your struggles and and all the things your rehab and all the things that, that are facing you. Please know that your church continues to pray for you. We continue to remember. We have, uh, of course, uh, Sherlyn, who's, who was here last week, but not able to be with us this week, but we continue to pray for Sherlyn. Uh, we continue to pray for Bill and for the upcoming surgery that he has and for a date for that surgery, right? That's, uh, that's really what we're praying for. We know it needs to happen, and uh, we're praying that it'll happen soon and that God will make that available and open to him. And of course, always, we remember uh, this morning. We remember those who've had an influence upon us. We remember those who God has given us the opportunity to be an influence upon as well. Whether they're part of our family or not, God brings, God brings folks into our lives very often. As sometimes friends, sometimes neighbors, uh, folks who we get as, as Christian witnesses, we get the opportunity to share with them uh, the wonderful news the, the gospel message that God has provided freedom from sin and sinning through Jesus Christ. That is the gospel message. And that is exactly what God calls us to witness and to be witnesses of in the world in which we live. This morning, I know that there are among us, just like at Mother's Day, there are those among us who are missing their fathers. There are those among us who, who remember those men, uh, perhaps their actual fathers and perhaps the men in their lives, uncles, cousins, neighbors, friends, who have had a strong influence, a strong spiritual influence upon their lives. And so this morning, we pray for those. We pray for those who are missing loved ones today. And we are mindful of the fact that God calls each of us to continue to be witnesses just in the tradition that was passed down to us. Let us pray. Father, this morning, we are grateful to you 
for all the folks that you've brought into our lives. Uh, sometimes we want to pick and choose. We want to put people in different boxes, and we want to say, well, I'm grateful for these people because of this, and I'm grateful for this person because this, and, and this person, well, I'm still praying about how I'm grateful for them. But this morning, Father, we are grateful for all the people that you have brought into our lives, for all of them in some way, shape, or form. Shape us, mold us, sharpen us, help us to be what you call us to be, are part of the ways in which you, Lord God, are bringing about spiritual maturity in our lives. We need those folks, Lord God, who will challenge us in our faith. We need those people, Lord God, who will be those strong witnesses for how they have overcome, how they are overcoming with your grace, with your help, the challenges that life throws at them. Father, we remember those folks today who you have brought into our life, and we are grateful to you for all of them. Father, this day we remember also our dads. We are grateful, Father, for them, whether we had a good relationship with them, whether we're still having a good relationship with them. Whatever memories we might have, we thank you, Father, for our dads. We ask, Lord God, that you will be with those today who are, who are missing, who are still, who find this as Mother's Day sometimes can be a difficult day as they are grieving. We pray especially today, Father, for, for those who have recently lost their dads, just within the last couple of months or even the last couple of years. We ask, Father, for your special grace upon them today. Bring your peace, your comfort, your strength to their minds and to their spirits today. Remind them, Father, that their hope, their strength, their peace is all in you through Christ Jesus. Father, we do pray for those among us who are sick because that's exactly what you ask us to do, what you tell us to do. And so, Father, we ask for you to be involved in the lives of those among us who are sick. For those, Lord God, like Miss Jerry, who have been through recent kinds of, of illness and recent things that they're dealing with, we ask, Father, for your, for your peace upon her today. We pray, Father, that you will bring your healing to her body. We thank you, Lord, that her, her mind, her spirit are firmly, firmly placed upon you. And we ask, Lord God, that you will continue to bring health to her as only you can. Father, for others among us who are going through longer terms of illness, we ask, Lord God, that you will be with them. Father, we continue to pray for Sherlyn, for Judy, for, um, for Donna, for, for Marge, for Neil, for Bill, for so many in our church, Lord God. For so many others, Father, that we might not have named this morning, but you know who they are. You are aware, Lord God, of everything about us all that's going on in our bodies, even those things that we don't share with others, Father, you know. And so we ask in this moment, Father, that you will bring your peace, your healing, your strength to each of us. Father, we depend upon you, for we know that in our strength, we cannot, we cannot bring glory to you in our strength alone. We know, Lord God, that we are dependent upon you for your strength, for your grace, for your help every moment of every day. And we thank you, Lord God, that you are always willing to bring that. Hear us now as we join our hearts and our voices together, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And sticking with our theme of God calling and humanity responding, we turn our attention this morning to a gospel reading, Matthew chapter 10. Listen to Jesus' words to his disciples and indirectly to us as well. Jesus says this, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour when you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father 
who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Let's stand and let's sing again together. Stand if you would, please, and we'll turn to number 667, our personal prayer this morning. Lord, speak to me. things thou dost impart and wing my words that they may reach the hidden depths of many a heart oh fill me with thy fullness Lord until my very heart o'erflow in kindling thought and glowing word thy love to tell thy praise to show oh use me lord use even me just as thou wilt and win and wear until thy blessed face i see thy rest thy joy thy glory share you may have a seat I remember, Robert, when you built this pulpit and you said, are you sure you need that big of a space underneath there for all the stuff? I need a bigger space. I got too much stuff in there. I can't find what I'm looking for. That's funny. Ah, over the course of this summer, we usually try to plan uh, try to plan out what's going on throughout the course of the summer especially. It's what's in the church calendar year known as ordinary time. It's, that means we're not approaching anything. We're not preparing for Easter. We're not preparing for Christmas. It's not Lent. It's not Advent. It's not getting ready for Pentecost. It's just ordinary time. I had a professor who used to say that the hardest part of the Christian life is just the day-to-day living. We expect to go through hard times. And as we go through hard times, we expect and and we're always grateful to find that God is with us during those difficult times, to find that that there are Christian brothers and sisters who God has placed upon our minds, upon our spirits, uh, to come alongside of us, to send a card, to give a call or a text, or just to show up and to give us a hug when we need that. When we go through those times of, of trouble, those times of darkness and pain and suffering and sorrow, God is so good to come alongside us in those moments and remind us that we're not alone, but that he's with us during those dark times. When we go through those high times in life, we talked about a little bit of that. You saw a little bit of that, a glimpse of what the rest of us who were at camp uh, the week before had, had experienced. As we were there, as we were had a week of, uh, of just being able to be away from everything, of turning everything off as much as possible, and of, of being involved in the lives of the campers and the other cabin leaders and the camp staff like we were. What an incredible blessing that always is. And, there, and God is always so faithful to come and to meet with us. Those are those mountaintop times. He said, in the valley and on the mountaintop is not where the Christian life is lived out. The Christian life is lived out in the 
daily grind in the 9 to 5 of Monday through Friday. And the older I get, the more I realize just exactly how true those words are. So over the course of this ordinary time that we face this summer, we're planning a journey. And that journey is through the book of Genesis. Trust me, <laughs> this won't be a verse-by-verse -verse kind of study. There simply aren't enough Sundays between now and next, and next summer to get, to get all of Genesis done in a verse-by-verse -verse kind of way. But what we will do as we go through this uh, over the course of the next few weeks is that we will examine and explore some of the key moments in the story of God's work to form a nation, to form his holy people and the work that he did in that and how that work continues to be done to this very day in us, in the body of Christ. Now, due to camp reports and other things last week, we missed hearing about how God, how, how God began the work of nation building. But last week, there was the story of Abraham being invited by God to follow. While there are many complexities in Abraham's stories, it's not too much of a stretch to sum it up like this. God extended grace and called Abraham to follow. Abraham responded to God's grace and trusted God. Abraham's act of responding in trust and faith to God's call enabled God to use Abraham as the first example that we come across, the first example I can think of anyway, in the scripture of salvation by grace through faith. While we tend to think of those words in kind of a, a New Testament, and especially a, a, a Paul kind of way of saying that, was, after all, we read from, from uh, the book of Romans just a little bit ago, Romans chapter 5, but the idea of God extending grace to humanity and humanity responding to God's grace in trust and in love, that, we see it very clearly in Abraham, but I, I know that it responds back. I said it started in Abraham, and now in my head I'm thinking, what about Noah? Well, of course, Noah. What about those who came before Noah? Well, of course, all those ways. That's how God always deals with humanity. God calls. Humanity hears and responds and trusts and follows, or hears and responds by turning away and going their own separate way. Those are the options that are before us. Abraham's act of responding to God, this example of salvation, of God's salvation at work in the world by grace, through faith, all of these things bring us into Abraham's story and help us to recognize why Abraham is not only seen as as the father of Judaism, but also the father of Christianity, and, in many circles, the father of Islam as well. For us today, as we move deeper into Abraham's story, we learn a little bit more about what it means to respond to and to trust God as God is leading and calling us to walk with him. In addition to God's call for Abraham to leave Ur and his family behind, God promised to make Abraham a great father. Abraham was about 75 and Sarah roughly 65 when this promise was made. So there were already some questions about how God would fulfill this promise. But Abraham trusted God, even when Abraham tried to hurry God's promise along in his own strength. We turn our attention away from the beginning of Abraham's call back in Genesis 12 to Genesis chapter 18 today. By the time that we find what's going on in Abraham's life in Genesis 18, Abram, Abraham sorry, Abraham is 99 and Sarah is 89. Since all of salvation history is linked back to this story, as we read this passage, we're, we're going to stop occasionally because we need to point out some of those links, some of those ties that bring us back into the New Testament and that remind us again of how important this story is to our own story of hearing and trusting and responding as God calls and offers grace. Chapter 18, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord appeared to him, appeared to Abraham, by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door 
in the heat of the day. Uh, so let me stop for just a second. Uh, basically what we see here is Abraham, having finished all of the morning chores, taking care of the animals, done the things that he needs to do, uh, taking care of all of the stuff, all of the, the daily grind kind of business, he sits down about nap time for those of us who, uh, who understand what the heat of the day is. It's time for him to take a little bit of a rest. You can give him a break for this, right? I mean, come on. He's 99 years old. Let the man have a nap. Don't judge him for that. There is this sense, though, in which as we see Abraham going through the business that Abraham was going through, taking care of the things that he took care of, just doing the daily grind, the work that has to be done every single day, we kind of hear echoes in this of Zechariah, of John the Baptist's father, who also was beyond the age of fathering a child, and yet was still receiving a promise of a son to be born. In the midst of all that Zechariah was doing there in the temple, when the angel appears to him, we have a very similar kind of moment. Verse 2. So Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And I love the way that, that, uh, that this is, is preserved for us here in the Scripture because it's almost as if you get the sense that in the heat of the day, as he's tired, all these things are going on. He's sitting down. The cool breeze is kind of blowing across, and he dozes off. And then suddenly he wakes up because there's someone standing right there. Did they, wake, did they walk up and he just missed them? Did they suddenly appear? We don't know. We don't even know who these folks are. But regardless of who they are, Abraham does exactly what he knew was the right thing to do. In this moment, he didn't, he didn't know who these folks were, but he knew that the right way to treat people was to welcome them and to help them and to offer to them the same grace that he had been offered through God. And so this is what he does. He sees the three men standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them. He bowed himself to the ground and he said, My Lord, or, or sir, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass on by. Do not pass your servant by. Please, let a little water be brought and wash your feet. We know of anything where feet are washed. Is there a New Testament example of that? Oh, yes, of course, preacher. It's John 13 in the upper room. Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. Let your feet be washed. Rest yourselves here under the tree. I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts and that you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. And the group said, do as you said. I love the fact that Abraham says, I'll bring a morsel of bread. Because we have this idea that, you know, okay, he's going to run in the house and he's going to grab whatever he finds. You know, there's a few club crackers he's going to run in and he's going to say to Sarah, 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 what's in, what's in the pantry? What do we have there? Well, I've got some graham crackers and some peanut butter. We could throw something together real quick and make a snack for these guys as they're passing by. Let me bring you a morsel of food. But what does he do? So he runs in. He hurries into the tent. And he runs into Sarah and he says, quickly, make three measures of fine meal. Get out the big mixing bowl. Pour in the good flour. Not the kind that still has the crumbs and not the kind that, you, have, you know, we have to pick the, the seeds out of our teeth when we're done. Get the good flour. Mix it all together. Make a big, big pile of biscuits. Is that wrong to say? Is it okay to say biscuits? Is it okay? Can we do that? Make a big batch. We've got folks here. We have company. And Abraham ran to the herd. And he took a tender and good calf, and he gave it to a young man, and he told him, hasten, prepare it. We have, of course, here kind of a, a, a double-sided thing. We have the, the idea of the sacrificial system that has not, at this point, been, in, been installed yet in the Jewish people, in the minds of the Jewish people, because God is still in the process of making a nation of the Jewish people. The law hasn't been given, but yet there is a hint here of giving your absolute best, of understanding that all that you have comes from God. And so why would you not give back to those who are in need? Here are these who have shown up out of nowhere. And Abraham says, let me extend grace. Let me demonstrate love 
to these because God has blessed me with so much. Let me give back to them. Of course, we also hear in this a bit of the prodigal son. Again, the understanding of one who is in need of receiving grace. And as he returns home, receives that in much more, so much more abundantly. Verse 8, so he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared, and he set it before them. Now, I've got to say, if these guys were in a hurry, and if they were really trying to travel and get somewhere, you're probably thinking, oh man, Abraham just took up like half a day of just preparation. Just the fact that they're, that they're making a huge bowl of bread, uh, you know, mixing it all together and then having to bake the bread and then going and getting the calf and having to prepare that and then cooking all of that and then bringing it and setting it down before him. Not only that, but, but butter for the bread as well and, and, uh, and yogurt or some sort of, of milk product in order to eat along with the food. All of these things are there. And he doesn't skimp on anything just as God never skimps on the grace, on the love that he pours into our lives, Abraham, in demonstrating again to these strangers, pours out for them everything that he has. Verse 9. Oh, and then he stood by them under the tree as they ate. So not only does he do all that, but he still, he stands there and he waits. Can I get you any more? Can I get you some more water? Can I fill your glass for you? Do you need any more? Here, let me, let me get you another biscuit from inside the house. Let me get you a fresh one. Verse 9, then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? Let me point out to you, this is a very curious question for anyone, for any man to ask another man in this culture. You didn't talk about that. Men did not talk about each other's wives. That was not a thing. But here's a stranger, someone who Abraham doesn't recognize as being part of his own family, and they're asking about his wife. Very curious. And Abraham said, she's here in the tent. And the man, the leader, said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And of course, in this, we hear again echoes from the beginning of the New Testament. Echoes of Elizabeth with John the Baptist. Echoes of Mary with Jesus. Now, Sarah, we're told, was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. I was reading something that my uh, New New Testament professor had written, and he said this. uh, Abraham and Sarah had already been old, and now they were well past being old. They were well advanced in years. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Verse 12, therefore Sarah laughed or chuckled or kind of <laughs> whatever inside of herself, saying, after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Shall I have the thing which my heart has so long has so longed for? Shall I have that thing, that one thing, to have a son, to have a child, to be able to present a child to my husband? Shall I have that after all, after all these years? Verse 13, and the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, surely I shall bear a child. Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Is anything too hard for the Lord? This is a rhetorical question. It, it's, it's the kind of question that you ask because you already know the answer, and you want the other person to realize that they already know the answer as well. But you ask the question anyway. It's a rhetorical question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And, of course, our immediate response is, no, there's nothing that's too hard for the Lord. And then we think about it. Do I live with that truth before me all the time? Is that the faith that I confess in my daily life? That there is nothing too hard for the Lord? Hmm. 
this question, this rhetorical question, stands at the heart of God's relationship with Abraham and with all of humanity. The promise of a child was made way back in chapter 12 where God promised that Abram would have descendants like the stars in the sky. And yet, all these years later, there is still no child for Abraham and Sarah. Sarah had heard from Abraham about God's promise, and Sarah had taken matters into her own hands by having, the fulfill, by having Abraham father the child Ishmael with Sarah's serving girl. But this was not the fulfillment God had in mind, and the resulting emotional and spiritual issues are still being felt to this day with the struggle between the descendants of Abraham's two sons. Where before God had spoken only to Abraham, now Sarah is included in the dialogue. Sarah's laughter, possibly silent laughter or chuckling to herself instead of laughing out loud. Sarah's laughter leads to a play on words regarding the name of the boy who is to be born. There's more to Sarah's laughter than we might first think. Sarah, by her own admission, is too old to have children. She and Abraham have tried in the past and every time there has been disappointment. So Sarah's reaction to this news reflects the layers of pain, of frustration, of questioning that she has faced since God made this promise 25 years before. But God proves that his promises are always faithful. In the right time and in the right way, the promise of a child to Abraham and Sarah is fulfilled. Jump over. To, verse 20, to chapter 21, starting in verse 1. There's a lot that goes on. If you're interested in what it is, there, trust me, we're skipping over some really good stuff. Go back and take a look at it this next week. But in verse 21, we find this. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. I'm not sure that I've ever included in a sermon before a quote from John Calvin, but I'm about to do that. As he had said, as he had spoken, emphasizes the fulfillment of God's promise. And here's the quote from Calvin. The reader must pause in the consideration of so great a miracle. The author who is writing about this event commends the faithfulness of God, as if he had said, God never feeds men with empty promises. Verse 2, Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son, who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Now, in between, I said there's a lot of in-between stuff. And what's happening in between is that there are certain storylines that are getting wrapped up. And the storyline that's getting wrapped up most clearly is the storyline of Lot. All of those things happen from chapter 18 to chapter 21. There's the storyline of Lot that's getting wrapped up in all of this. That possibility of maybe, maybe it's Lot who God's talking about is taken completely out of the picture. So that at the right time, in the right way, Abraham or Sarah conceives, and Abraham has a child in his own age. Verse three: Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Again, this is before the law has been established, before the law has been given. But how does Abraham respond to God's promise being fulfilled? In trusting obedience, he completely obeys and follows through with what God commands him. Verse 5, now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, for I have borne him a son in his old age. God has done what God had promised. When Abraham and Sarah saw no way, even after the couple decided they knew how to fulfill God's promise better than God knew how, God provided a son. The boy's name, Isaac, is a loose translation of the Hebrew word for laughing. 
So every time Isaac's name was called, Isaac, come to dinner. Isaac, pick up your toys. Isaac, put your shoes on. Isaac, bring in the camels from out on the pasture. Every time Isaac's name was called, it became an opportunity to remember the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and to Sarah. And this remembering of a fulfilled promise led the family to worship God for God's provision and for God's faithfulness. So as we wrap up this morning, we ask this question. What has God promised us? There are three promises that immediately spring to mind. The first comes from Matthew 28, the second part of verse 20. Jesus' words to his disciples right before he is taken back up to the Father, where Jesus says these words, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The second place that came to mind was in Hebrews chapter 13. Again, the second half of verse 5, where the writer of the letter or the sermon that we know as the Hebrews said this, For he himself, for God himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God doesn't turn away from us, but that opportunity is always there for us to respond to God, which always means that there is the possibility that we may turn away from God. We don't have to. We don't have to. It's not a given, but the possibility is there. How will we respond to God? With love, with obedience, with continued following, or will we say, God, you've shown me what you can do. Now, let me go do what I want to do. Let me take matters into my own hand. Let me take the reins for a while. Let me take the wheel and go on my way instead of your way. Trust me. Every time that we fall into that trap, there's pain and there are consequences. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then the final promise, the final place. Now, I know this is not the final one. There are many, many more that we could go to, but these were the three that, that popped in mind. Revelation 21.3, where God has allowed John to see so much, to see things that no human eye had ever seen before. And then at the end of time, to be able to hear God speak and to say this, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle or the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Each of these promises are made to those who are living in relationship with God through faith in Jesus. There is no time limit set on their fulfillment. Some of these things are being fulfilled right now, in this moment. Some of them have been fulfilled in the past, in our life, in our, in our view of how time works. And some will be fulfilled in the future. But there's no timeline, there's no set limit on how God is doing this. The response that God requires of us today is the same response that God required of Abraham and Sarah. Trust and follow. Do we always see the way in which God is fulfilling his promises? No. In fact, there are times we, like Sarah, may wonder if God has forgotten us. Regardless of how we may feel in the circumstances of life which we face, the reality we cling to is that God is bigger than the trouble or the fear that we encounter. God has promised. God is promising. And God will faithfully bring every one of his promises to fulfillment at the right time and in the right way through Christ. And this is the way which brings glory to God. As we sing our final hymn together this morning, I invite you to listen. Not only as the music is, is playing, not only as the song is being sung, but listen. Listen to what God is saying through the words. Listen to what God has said through the preaching, through the reading of the Scripture. Listen this morning. Is there some way in which you realize that like Sarah, you 
you've started wondering if God has forgotten you, so this is a perfect opportunity, perfect opportunity to be reminded that God has not forgotten, that God is with us, and that God is calling each of us into relationship with himself. Let's sing. Let's do let's sing that today. Let's stand together and sing Pass Me Not, number four eighty nine in your hymnals. Father, you have done what you always do, for you are the faithful God. You who have called us here today have met with us here today, not because we've created any kind of special atmosphere or anything like that, but simply because you are the faithful God. You are the God who keeps your promises. Where two or more are gathered, you have met with us. Thank you, Father. Thank you for being the God who we trust the God who keeps promises, the God who calls us into relationship with himself. And now, Father, as we bring a close to this time together that you've given us this morning, we remember that you send us out into this world, into this world that is hurting, into this world that has been scarred and twisted by the presence of sin. And yet, Father, you call us to go out like sheep among wolves, as Jesus said, to go out with the message of hope, a message of peace, a message of redemption. Father, this is what you have given to us today. You send us out to proclaim what we know to be true about you. We go, Lord God, in your grace. We go, Lord God, in your power. We go, Lord God, with hearts full of your peace, knowing that you go with us. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen.
The 100th Psalm is the inspiration for the song that we sing, the doxology. Hear this psalm this morning. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him, and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. We are entering into his courts as we leave this place this morning. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You're dismissed to his courts. <laughs>